And this um, is incredibly prevalent on prevalent, is that a word? Okay, number three, no. Prevalent, 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 that is a word. <laughs> oh my God, I'm making up words now. Declassé, to behave like that. De, 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 de. Or rather, my consciousness is, 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 is a, ah, what am I talking about? What am I talking about? I sound absolutely <laughs> crazy. Okay. Okay, hi guys. Uh, it smells like there's a fire right now, so I'm gonna try and hurry up. Really smells like something's burning. Hmm. Right, let's do this quickly. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today I'm gonna discuss my nine watch collecting mistakes. Please do add yours in the comments. Let's try and help out as many people as we can. And don't forget to like this video, very important indeed to support the channel. Now, do a quick wristwatch check, wearing the Dan Henry 1962 uh, on one of their own straps. Uh, I just love this combination, that little pop of color with the cognac. So, let's get into it. Okay, number one is buying watches too quickly. I know I do this all the time, I still do. I have to fight myself not to pull the trigger too quick. Uh, at worst, it can be an impulse buy without shopping around and then you see it for like cheaper somewhere else and you're like, damn it. Uh, and other times it's more profound. It's a kind of passing fad. As a more experienced enthusiast, I have come to learn from my own behavioral patterns. I tend to get obsessed about a particular watch almost on a monthly basis, stalking them on eBay endlessly, reading about them and learning everything I possibly can, to the point of then calculating what watches I already own, I can start trading in for them. And this can go on for weeks. But then one day I wake up and the desire has completely, well, evaporated. Had I have sold some of my beloved watches in my collection for the particular watch I was obsessing about, what typically happens is a short honeymoon period with the new crush, and inevitably it would have been a mistake. I tend to find that it takes several months to truly figure out if it's true love or just a passing infatuation. The very worst of this for me, and I've wasted hundreds and hundreds of dollars, specifically with vintage watches, and even more specifically, chronographs, because of course they're more complex, there's more chances of things going wrong. Some of the parts inside the components need replacing, and those were costly, because of course some of them weren't being produced anymore. So this is the kind of things that you really, really have to look into. So as you guys know, I designed the Unico case, so you could store your watch on your person, in your pocket, without needing a bag, etc, uh, etc. Et and I tested it on thousands of watches. I've done all this before. Uh, but nice plug though, huh? I'll leave a link down below. But the reason I'm bringing up the Unico case is because I found that with watches I truly, truly love uh, and are not passing uh, kind of crushes, so to speak, I don't switch the watch. I keep that watch on. I think I start thinking, wow, God, I could be a one watch guy. I should sell everything. And of course, you know, that doesn't last for long. But the fact I do consider it for a split second, I think that is a good indication that it is true love and not just a passing phase. Okay, number two is seller's remorse. This does not apply to everyone. There are some rare collectors out there that don't flip any of their watches, but for the most part, for most of us, I think we've experienced this. So I've made this particular mistake so many times because once sold, not always, but seller remorse sets in. You see on somebody else's Instagram, or even worse, on a friend's wrist, and before you know it, you have bought and flipped the same watch three times. And yes, my dear old Zin 104, I'm looking at you. This often happens if there are multiple versions of a particular watch you really, really like. The PVD Squiler 1521 and the Azzurra are a prime example of this. What I recommend doing is putting that watch away for a month or two 
and then getting it out again and seeing how you feel before you flip it. Either two things will happen. You truly are bored with that watch or you have a second honeymoon. At some point, you have to put your foot down and tell yourself it's a keeper. As it's obvious, rebuying the same watch three times is such a waste of money. You might as well just keep the damn thing. The very worst seller remorse is when they are a rare watch and then after you've sold it, it explodes in value, making it even more costly or just difficult to rebuy. The limited edition Tissot Genero is perhaps the greatest example of this. So number three is waiting for that perfect watch and I don't think it exists. What happens here is that you choose one watch over another because of the specifications, not because of a connection. Sometimes it is the imperfections, kind of like people, it's the imperfections that give characteristics. It's those quirky things. Let's look at the uh, Flightmaster, for example, those strange lugs that's so close to the case. It's a nightmare to put a NATO strap in there, but it wears smaller as a result. Like my Tudor sub, for example, there's patina on the hands, the bezel is bidirectional, the tritium loom is dead, and the crystal is plexiglass, even though it's from the 1990s, and the bigger brother Rolex equivalent from the same time was already getting sapphire glass, luminova, and unidirectional bezel upgrades. But do I love it any less? Well, truthfully, no. I enjoy it for what it is, despite all its faults. I often see people commenting, I will not buy a particular watch because of the water resistance might be too low, for example, or the resale value is weak, the movement is not accurate enough, or the bracelet is rubbish, and this, that, and whatever brand is not good enough. Sometimes people are just limiting themselves and simply missing out. This has happened to me on several watches, once on my wrist or in the metal, I totally forget about any limitations I was once concerned about. And sometimes there's an ineffable quality to a watch that does not translate in pictures or in videos. The prime example for me is the Rolex Explorer, a watch that for years, years, I dismissed as simply too boring. And then of course, um, I tried it and again, now it's another favorite watch of mine. Waiting your whole life for perfection is pretty much a wasted life because you're gonna miss out on so much fun in the meantime. The more you get out there, the more you experience, the more rewarded you will be. A good example of my obsession with ticking boxes is with the moon phase. For some reason, I keep doing this to myself and returning to this one particular topic. I find myself obsessing over a complication that I will never actually use. Sure, I get some enjoyment from looking at it, and perhaps on some deeper level, it's to do with a wider obsession from old Tompion clocks. But that is another story. When I found the perfect moon phase, I wore it twice in one year. Did I feel more complete? Did the collection feel more complete? Not really. And so I sold it and spent the money on watches I enjoy and wear far more. Does every collection need a beta watch or a dress watch or a diver or a chronograph, etc.? Okay, number four is size is everything. But what's important to note here is don't go on the diameter of the watch alone. And I've seen this with the SKX, with the Squally 1521, with several Navi timers, that the diameter, what I you know, thought was gonna be too big for me, absolutely wears fine and vice versa. There are some small watches, 36 millimeters, perfect. And then it turns out to be too small. It's got to do with the lug to lug, the height, the angle of the lugs, how it positions on the wrist, and every wrist is different. So really do not um, write off a watch until you've tried it. I know it sounds simple, but you never know. That watch you thought was too big works perfectly. Okay, so number five is understanding your own style, and it evolves constantly, tastes change. This is perfectly normal. When does ownership become more than necessity? If ownership is what does it for you as a collector rather than function, by all means, indulge. I mean, after all, one $50 quartz dive watch is all you actually really need. Understanding the difference between what you like and what actually works for you is also extremely important. You may lust after a certain watch or genre of watch. Will you actually wear it and enjoy it? This is often confused by watches looking great on social media or someone else's wrist and may not actually work for you personally. For example, a blinged out AP might look great on your favorite rapper's wrist, but not so much for your middle-class cousin Brad from the suburbs. 
Buying watches you don't actually wear inevitably leads to what we call safe queens. And nothing is sadder than watches not getting that precious wrist time and just sitting there unappreciated. Well, to answer this question, you have to figure out your requirements. Uh, you have to look at your sartorial choices, your uh, situational uh, requirements as well, like, like what kind of environment, what do you do for a living, these kind of things. Uh, not to mention size, scale and all the rest of it, which we just mentioned. The price to enjoyment ratio. So typically, the more you spend on a watch, the more you get. Quality, craftsmanship, precious metals, perhaps, brand prestige, and so on. However, one thing that price does not dictate is enjoyment. Never forget this. Is a watch that costs 10 times more than the next watch 10 times better? Not necessarily. We all know a $10 Casio F91W is more accurate and has more functions than a Rolex Submariner. So is it worth it? And the same can be true for the opposite. My Mission Impossible Casio, for example, gives me immense joy, far more than some of my luxury watches, costing 200 times as much. So as I've said before, I don't believe in this climbing the ladder, getting more and more expensive watches and then discarding the entry-level stuff. I, I don't believe in it. I, this petty bourgeois obsession. Well, that's for people who fixate on status and value. I don't look at watches like that. One of my pet peeves is the watch dealer types who masquerade as watch enthusiasts. Unfortunately, YouTube is full of them these days. It seems watch dealers are now the new used car salesmen of today. One of the signs is their obsession with value, along with constantly putting watches into tiers based on the brand. This is natural as dealers are not buying for enjoyment, but as a commodity to trade or invest in. If you are buying watches for investment, that is something completely different. Personally, I do not equate that with true watch collecting. A real watch enthusiast appreciates the art, design, feeling they evoke, the history or story behind them. To be an independent, family-owned Swiss watch brand for decades and to exist successfully among the big corporations is our accomplishment. This is in fact the very room where back in 1926 the first automatic wristwatch was produced. Our watches aren't made for the mass. We craft with a deep love to detail. We create watches to be used. We create true companions. Now, I'm not saying do not take value retention into consideration. It's actually quite important, but it should not be the only thing. This can be a mistake, and I believe enjoyment always should come first, no matter how unquantifiable. Okay, number seven is hell is other people's opinions. With this online world, uh, we're seeing people becoming increasingly more solipsistic, not accepting the tastes or opinions of others. You know the types, they're always like, oh, well, my way is right, you're wrong because of blah, 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 and all this stuff. And this is, of course, exacerbated with this social media. There are endless hordes of forum keyboard tough guys dissatisfied with their own limitations, most often stemming from incredibly unrewarding lives, and thus lashing out online. If you are easily offended or one of those people that loves to pointlessly waste their time arguing with strangers over subjects like watches, this advice is for you. One of the biggest mistakes is to be too easily persuaded by others' opinions and not buying what you love and following your own heart and intuition especially when most of the opinions of others are from the perspectives of those who have never even truly experienced the watch in question. Not always, of course. And it would be so boring if we were all the same. But at the end of the day, the only opinion that matters is your own. And always remember that detractors are often criticizing you to either give themselves a feeling of importance by pushing you down or to offload their own toxicity. Now, I understand that not everyone's going to be a YouTuber like me and uh, forced to either gain a thick skin or you just have one to begin with, right? But when you are online, I do think it is important not to lower yourself to that level of toxicity by arguing and blah, 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 to rise above it. After all, they're the ones with the issue. And taste is very subjective. So try and see things from their perspective. Don't put other people down for their opinions and their uh, preferences. I think it, at the end of the day, it reeks of insecurity and it's just, well, rather classless. Okay, number eight, it's the scratch that itch watch. And what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. Okay, so let's say you really want a Submariner, but it's not in your budget right now, or you just don't 
think spending that much amount of money, and I don't blame you because the prices are <laughs> absolutely insane, you don't agree with it as a principle, perfectly fine. So you buy homage, great. But what I'm talking about is people that they're saving, they're saving, they see, whoo, you know, their eyes wander, they get a different luxury watch and then end up being dissatisfied. To me, it's a false economy. If you are already spending thousands, why not just keep saving? I feel it's better to buy something very affordable in the meantime and just use that until you get the sub you've always wanted. But again, this is just in my opinion. It's your hard earned money and never let anybody tell you how to spend it. But this does not apply just to luxury watches. It could be a Seiko Flightmaster, for example, at $250. But then you buy the very similar looking Casio EF527D-1AV at a little over half the price of the Flighty. Sure, it's a cool watch and does the job almost as well. But once the watch you buy to scratch that itch costs more than half the value of the watch you really want, I think that is the turning point and I highly recommend that you consider to keep saving because eventually you're only going to shortchange yourself. You'll feel so much more accomplished when you finally get that flighty. Okay, number nine is not enjoying or rushing the thrill of the hunt, especially when you're really excited about a watch. You're saving, you're learning about it, you're falling down these incredibly rewarding uh, rabbit holes. To me, that's one of the most enjoyable aspects of collecting. So enjoy it. Life is a perpetual state of learning, not just with watches. This is also why I would never call myself a connoisseur or an aficionado. It would be arrogant to do so. Humility is a trait somewhat lost these days, but very noble. And there's always somebody that knows more about whatever subject in question than you. The accumulation of knowledge is one of the greatest things in life, perhaps the most important. It can improve your life exponentially. If watch collecting is giving you anxiety, especially in this part of it, you are simply doing it wrong. Watch collecting should not be about making up for something that you might be lacking in the rest of your life. It should be about adding to it. Time after all is the most precious commodity of all. You can't buy more of it. So enjoy the moment and the sharing of it with others. Okay, so there we have it. I hope that has helped you. Uh, please do share yours in the comments. I'd love to hear what you uh, uh, regularly do, if you want to admit to it or not. <laughs> do share that in the comments. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.